Christians. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here at the birthplace of civilization. I also hope it's not the end of civilization. Um, so we're talking about the great unknown today. But actually, it's not that unknown. We know what's going to happen. And I have to be careful not to be too angry when I say this. But we know what's going to happen. We're heating up. We're going to burn up. And we're all going to die. That's what's going to happen. So I have a friend who says, Clark Fox, who says the world ended for him and for his tribe in the 1800s. And that basically he's been living in a, in a world that died a long time ago. But now it's going to happen to all of us. And this is the other problem that even our democracy, and you guys gave us democracy, right? We, need, we still don't have real democ democracy, right? So we still want democracy. And the alternative to that, and, and here's the problem. There's a few billionaires in the world who've decided they don't want to pay taxes. So since they don't want to pay their taxes, it's much easier to destroy democracy than to actually pay their taxes. And that's what's happening today in the world. And so we're not able to solve anything, any of our wicked problems. And this is, of course, a picture of COVID back from 18, uh, 1543 in the Palazzo Abatelis in Palermo. This is the last time we saw the plague. Death came and killed everyone regardless. Billionaires, poor people, everybody got an arrow in the neck. But the problem now is this. Every problem is interlinked, and you can't actually solve one without solving the others. And so you've got to actually look at them all together. And we're calling them the world's seven wicked problems. The death of nature. And I'm going to come back to this because it, you know, the Mediterranean is going to be very hard hit. But the death of nature, income inequality, hate and conflict, which is you know, polarization, which is actually driven intentionally to keep us fighting with each other instead of bringing us together. Power and corruption, which is sort of the fundamental reason why nothing changes. Uh, media, work, you know, later on we're going to talk about work and the future of work. What work? There's not going to be any work. Uh, you know, we're going to be replaced by robots. Even the CEO is going to get replaced by a robot. Uh, you know, especially if it's the kind of CEO who manages by spreadsheet. Which, which a lot of, you know, as you know, if you know your CEO, you know what they do. Uh, I'm half kidding, not really. Uh, <laughs> you know, health and livelihood, population and migration, and I'm going to come back to all of these. But here's the thing, these are such big problems, you go, how can I do anything? What can I do? Well, at the highest level, you know, there's brand activism. We need to get brands together. Companies need to come together and say, hey, governments, let's work together to solve problems instead of, you know, create, creating them. But at your level, in your neighborhood, in your community, we want to talk about regeneration. So we were talking about sort of how to solve big problems, and then we said, okay, in my neighborhood, what can I do? What can we do in, in our neighborhood, in our community? There's got to be something we can do. So we've come up with this idea called regener uh, community re regeneration. And it's, this is sort of the idea. And it's not my idea. It's not our idea. It's an idea that basically comes to us from the Native Americans, from the indigenous people of the world, who have come together and said, this is what we must shift to if we want to have a future. And you recognize this, right? The alternative to the way to govern is not by the gun. You can't militarize everything. What are we going to do? Just stand there with guns and tell people this is how you have to live? Or are we going to create a world that is worth living in? So this is what we mean by regeneration. Regeneration is really about improving the community, the place you live in. Not, and it's beyond sustainability. It has to be sustainable, of course. So, you know, I know Athens is doing the zero emissions by 2030. That's incredible. 
you guys are going to have to really change the way things work in Athens for that. Elini, hi. Yeah, um, it's, it's an amazing thing that Athens has pledged to do because few cities have done that. But it's not going to be easy. But the idea is, if you look at this chart, businesses are going to have to do two things. You know, in business school, they teach you, how do we create business value? You know, how do we create uh, value for our business? Value creation. But the value creation needs to be done not just for business, but also for the community. How do you create value for the community? And this is the real question of re regeneration. The regenerative economy is beyond the circular economy because it actually spreads the wealth, circulates the wealth, and creates wealth in the community. And that's what we want. That's what the future has to be. Otherwise, we have that other, you know, the cliff that we're flying off of. So how do we create community value? By the way, you know, so let me give you an example. When the East India Company landed in India, uh, India was 35, 30% of the GDP of the world. When the British left India, we were 2%. So that's how, you know, unreach. So I want you to do, I want companies, and, and we need the corporate world to do the opposite. When they land in a community, the community that they serve has to be better off than if they were not there. And that's called regeneration. So how do we do this? In the corporate world, for business value creation, we have a B2B pyramid of value. It's called elements of value. This is like Harvard Business Review, all that stuff. They've got all these articles about how to create value in B2B and B2C, but they don't have it for the community. So we built one for the community. Here, these are the elements of value, very basic things. Food, water, shelter, Education, healthcare, basics. We don't do that. We don't even do that. And then we expect, you know, great things to happen. So regeneration is a process. And it, it's not one process that works for this place and the same process. It doesn't work the same everywhere. You've got to have different places. Will, depending on the place, will have different strengths. So we've created this process that has about 20 different ways to regenerate rate a place. And I'm going to tell you the story of how we ended up in Palermo, uh, which is in the Mediterranean and really has some of the same problems that all the Mediterranean cities have. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. But the way this happened, we were on a Zoom call with the mayor of Palermo and Assessora Cetina Martorana, who basically said, you know, I don't want my kids to have to leave Palermo and go north to find a job. I want them to live in Palermo. Why can't we have a place, why can't we create a city where our kids don't have to leave to, to find a good job? And so with that, she was basically saying, please come. And so Philip Kotler, who was, you know, the father of modern marketing, he basically says, Christian, you go to Palermo. So one second to the next, I'm in Palermo, and now we're, my wife decided we're moving there. But... Palermo is sort of this beautiful place that is sort of struggling because it doesn't have the funds. You know, Athenians know this kind of thing too. You know, your, your funds are always behind. The, the, you know, the public funds aren't there to do things you need to do. And yet people are able to do things. People work hard. I'll give you an example now. I'm going to show you. This is an example of a regenerative business. Lucia Lauro was a social worker. Her first job when she was a kid, when she started, was saving kids who were being sold into human trafficking. She basically saved these kids, picked them up and took them away from their parents and saved them on the streets. Then she had to hide for a while, and then they gave her another job. They said, okay, we want you to take these kids who are coming out of jail and find them jobs. Great. Nobody was hiring. Nobody wants to hire people from jail. So she said, okay, you're not hiring them. I'm going to hire them. I'm going to create a, a company, and I'm going to hire them. So she started her own business, a prison brand, where they actually bake cookies in jail. It's called Coti in Fragranza, which means caught in the act. And it's in 35 cities now that they're exporting these, these cookies all over Europe. When they come out of prison, these kids get to work at Alfresco Bistro, which is a bistro with a Michelin chef. 
The Michelin chef decided, I don't want to be that Michelin chef. I want to help the kids. So he left the stress, high stress of the restaurant world and, and ended up you know, helping these kids. And now they're expanding where they're building a and b on top of that. So this is a new kind of business. It's a co-op. It's regenerative. Its purpose is to help the community and create some value for the community and the kids. And guess what? She doesn't get paid a thousand times what the normal employee gets paid. She gets paid the same as the guy who's in charge of the restaurant. So she's not the CEO in the sky. Every city is made up of people. If you look enough, you'll find these people. They're there. The problem is that stories are disconnected and they don't talk to each other and sometimes they're isolated from each other. So the question is, how can we bring these stories together? How can we work to build an ecosystem where these kind of ego-free leaders can work together and do something even more than what they're doing in their own little circle? So it's about bringing people together, building trust, building networks of trust. And of course, as you know, in the Mediterranean, we have a history of distrust. People don't want to talk to each other. They're afraid. There's you know, historical reasons. There's family reasons. There's, oh, that guy's family 800 years ago was an idiot, and so we can't talk to them. But in Palermo, we said, OK, let's, let's bring everybody together, as many people as we can. And we had three questions for our regenerative project. The first question was, how do we bring back tourism? Because tourism had gone away. You know, 80%, 90% of the economy for Palermo was tourism. But we want a new kind of tourist. You know, how do we bring back tour the tourist economy in a more regenerative way? Second, how do we expand beyond tourism? Now, all of this is the same for Athens, too, actually. How do we expand beyond tourism, but again, in a regenerative way that's sustainable and actually builds wealth in the community, not just for a few tour operators or a few companies? And lastly, what are the big challenges? You remember the Wicked Seven? How, does, how do those Wicked Seven challenges apply to my city for the future? So what I'm going to do is just go over one or two things that we came up with for each one. We had lots of recommendations, but I'll tell you a funny story before that. So when we were doing a speech like this about the future of Palermo, the first question we get, this guy walks up and says, you don't speak the language, which I don't. You don't know anything about us, which I don't. <laughs> you have, are not going to do an anthropological study of the city, and you think you're going to tell us how to live and what to do? So, so everybody kind of went, ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> Even the mayor, who were like, oh, okay, everybody woke up. But he was right. We don't really have an answer. The answer is with you guys. You guys are going to have, I mean, it's really the business leaders the social leaders, the religious leaders have to learn to work together. Right now, we're all sitting in our own little, you know, castles or whatever we want to call them, but not working together. And we need to find a way to work across these boundaries. So the first thing we said, we need a different kind of tourism because tourism today is going to be far different from the tourism. Uh, tomorrow is going to be far different from the tourism of today. We need a regenerative tourism, tourist. So it's like a slow tourist who comes, spends two or three weeks in your city instead of two or three days, who immerses themselves in the culture of the place, and how do you design your city to create this kind of tourism? So it's, it's much lower carbon footprint, much more community spreading of the wealth, and of course a much better experience and a much more educational experience. So your city here is, is you know, I'm, I'm gonna go, the first place I'm gonna go tomorrow is the place where Socrates died. And I asked the guys, hey, where is this place? Nobody knows where this place is. Come on, guys. Okay. Second, so everybody's talking about digitalization. How do we transform, you know, the digital transformation? The problem with the digital transformation is everybody's doing their own version of a platform and everything else. What we really want to do is create a platform that's owned by the community. Not by the mayor, not by some, but by the people who are in the community. So it becomes a public value creation platform, not a private value. So you don't have to charge a 30% cut to Amazon or a 29% uh, cut to whoever is owning that platform. That platform needs to be a co-op. 
If you do this, then you can put all your platforms, education, healthcare, social, uh, social stuff, your, all your services, everything can be on this platform. And every city can share the same platform because it's not new stuff. And yet we insist on doing our own thing every time. Okay, now this is the most important thing, which is the future. And it, it really is the part, the reason I'm here in a way. Because we know what happened last summer. It was 50 degrees in Palermo. It's going to be 50 degrees over here. Everything's on fire, and we're still sleeping. We're like, eh, I'll just crank up the AC. So the future challenge, remember we talked about the Wicked Seven. Where are they, what are the big problems that are coming? We're going to have 150 million climate refugees coming north. You know, we can't even handle a million. Think about 150 million. So how are we going to stop that or mitigate that? The way to stop it is to build a wall, an economic wall across northern Africa. What would happen if we brought light manufacturing, the manufacturing we do for Europe, but put it in northern Africa? You'd have employment in northern Africa, and this would prevent people from, they'd have a job, and they would stop coming to Europe for that reason. And this, by the way, has been done before on the border with Mexico. It's called maquiladora, in, the maquiladora industry in Mexico. Um, the second thing we need to do at the same time, and this is something the EU needs to do, it's not something just for Athens, not just for Palermo, it's the entire Mediterranean and really the EU. How do we make the Sahara green again? We have to build the north, same northern belt has to become much more green. So Elon Musk, instead of terraforming Mars, come terraform the Sahara first. And actually, it's not as impossible as you think. So the question is, why is nothing happening? Or very little happening, next to nothing. It's because you know what happens when people challenge billionaires. What happened to Socrates? He, he spoke up against Elon Musk and the billionaires, and look what happened to him. And let's not let this be our new normal. Let's be regenerative. Thank you.